Welcome everyone. We will wait a couple of seconds more just to give time to the participants, to the attendees to come in the meeting room of this webinar. We are around 50. Okay. We, we will strict following the, the time that is scheduled for the webinars and welcome everyone. Welcome to this new webinar of this series of webinars that we start in Indus, discussed action that ends in last uh, October. And now is the WMO Barcelona DAS Regional Center that is the center that is managing the activities of this WMO program called San Andago Storm Warming Advisory and Assessment System. And today uh, we will have the pleasure to have Angela Benedetti in as an invited speaker that will overview a little bit the activities and, uh, and all the works going to the direction to really provide seasonal predictions to for future. And um, just some tips about the tool that you are using, that is the Zoom webinar. Uh, as a participant, you cannot interact directly with us. You can you have two windows. One is called questions and answers that is in your menu. And here you can write all your questions during the event. And we will launch all the questions to Angela when she will finish the talk. But also you can talk with us through the chat. Uh, Nitschko, that is not in the camera, but the slobo than Nitschko is sharing the session with me and we will take care of all your comments and questions and and um, and with it this logistics uh, I will introduce our speaker that as I said is Angela Benedetti she's working she's based in Reading in the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecast she's been there for a long time and is a reference in the in the development and maintaining the aerosol assimilation system that is providing this global aerosol focus uh, through the Copernicus initiative. And she's, per, she's uh, enrolled in different WMO initiatives as the SDS was or the SAC of aerosols, for example, and also some ESA projects related with the Aeolus mission. And today, is, is, is presenting us all the research that she's conducted with Frederic Pitar, uh, going to the understanding of the aerosol radiative impacts in this subseasonal to seasonal prediction. And if you are ready, Angela, the floor is yours. Uh, your talk will be 40 minutes, and then I will tell you when, when we arrive 10 minutes before 40, OK? Great. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thanks for the invitation. Share my screen. And that's the last slide. So let me start from the top. Okay, I hope you can see the, the screen. Um, yes. yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so, yes, my pleasure. It's my pleasure to be uh, um, in this uh, forum to talk about uh, um, aerosols and predictability at the S2S scale, which is the seasonal to subseasonal scale. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot about uh, dust seasonal prediction. Um, I will only have one slide actually on the potential for that. Uh, so I hope that the, those of you who joined are hoping to hear about seasonal dust forecasts won't be too disappointed. So the talk will be more on the, you know, on the impact of aerosols on the prediction at those scales, uh, rather than the predictions of the aerosols per se. But hopefully, you know, you will be interested anyway. And uh, I want to say thank you to Frédéric Vital, uh, who's the uh, architect of the S2S system here at ACMWF, and many thanks to the colleagues from the Copernicus Atmosphere Monitoring Service team, CAMS, and the other, many other colleagues at ACMWF that I recognize in the presentation. So just uh, um, diving right in, um, I'll just give you a general background of the problem. Uh, I'm going to show how aerosols impact 
and WP um, in a general sense, and then uh, show some examples from the uh, ECMWF experience uh, at the S2S scales, and then um, have some um, summary and open questions. Um, so aerosols and weather, um, there are aerosols, um, as you know, particularly dust, which is the most abundant uh, um, aerosol, um, are very important for the climate and as well for the weather. Here I focus on the weather aspects because uh, I guess at ECMWF, that's what we are mainly interested in. Um, so we have like, you know, um, natural um, emitted uh, aerosols like sea salt and dust, and then the, the, the um, um, anthropogenic species emitted through um, industrial processes, but also through, um, uh, for example, black carbon organic matter through uh, biomass burning, uh, which can be both <coughs> anthropogenic and also naturally occurring, and then emissions of, uh, for example, volcanic ash. <coughs> from um, volcanoes, uh, so mainly sulfate aerosols. And all these aerosols interact with the solar radiation um, and um, through scattering processing. And uh, so they are very relevant um, as far as the radiative balance is concerned. Um, and also they're very important for um, indirect um, uh, effects uh, on clouds because aerosols, as you know, are um, form um, serve to form um, clouds. Uh, dust is mainly for ice clouds, so as ice nuclei and other aerosols as cloud condensation nuclei. Um, so all this complex system um, has, uh, um, you know, interacts with the rest of the um, Earth system uh, model and and. Uh, the impacts, the mechanism um, of impact on NWP occur through different processes and at different time scales. And uh, this table illustrates that, uh, for example, um, the impact on NWP may occur through the dynamics and the thermodynamics, uh, and the mechanism is the radiative interaction, because as the aerosols interact with the radiation, they change the heating rates um, in uh, profiles, and that has an impact on temperature and on winds as well, and uh, therefore on the, on the dynamics and thermodynamics of the model. Um, likewise, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the impact on the clouds as ice nuclei, cloud condensation nuclei, and also, again, through radiative effects uh, as an impact on precipitation and clouds. Um, then we have the tracer mechanism. This is uh, something very specific to the uh, for Divar. So when you have like a tracer, uh, for example, um, uh, aerosols such as dust detected by the by the wind, uh, through using observations on those traces, you may infer through the 4D bar information on the winds. So that's another thing that is not necessarily a direct impact, but um, you know has quite a could play a role in um, in NWP having this uh, uh, tracer mechanism in their simulation, and. Um, then, of course, the radiance assimilation. Again, we already said how the aerosols are important for the radiation, radiative transfer, uh, both in the short wave and in the long wave. And so that has direct bearing on assimilation of radiances um, for, um, to infer, for example, temperature, water vapor, and etc. And then here at the bottom of the table, you see all the different ranges that are of interest um, for weather for, uh, forecasting. So the analysis is when you do like, you know, the uh, time zero, if you wish. So um, all these processes are quite relevant. But then as you go along, you know, in the scale, uh, they are relevant at all um, ranges, so medium range, uh, which is up to roughly day 10. The subseasonal range, which is uh, approximately um, four weeks, four weeks, um, um, 40 days and the, the seasonal range up to um, up to a month, uh, several months. Sorry, and of course I don't, you know, mean to um, um, like say that aerosols are not important in the climate. Of course, we know they are very important. But as I said, the focus at ECMWF is more on the uh, weather scales. So these are the ranges that we look at. So um, let me talk about a uh, little bit about the 
uh, background at ECMWF, uh, what we've done with the um, aerosols and atmospheric composition in general. So the development started in the, um, in the late 1990s actually, um, and continued throughout the year uh, 20, 2010 and 2020 20 now uh, with several projects. So you see here a series of projects, GEMS, MAC, and now the uh, Copernicus Atmosphere Monitoring Service. Uh, I wrote system and that's a mistake, sorry, <laughs> should be service. And uh, um, what has happened is that uh, through these projects, um, the uh, integrated forecast system, which is the model which is used at ECMWF for uh, the prediction, for the weather prediction, has been developed to include also atmospheric composition elements. So initially ozone, stratospheric ozone, and then progressively capos chemistry, integrated chemistry, and aerosol and um, greenhouse gases. So the, the developments in the aerosol started in uh, uh, around 2004 and are uh, still continuing nowadays. Um, and uh, throughout uh, the years there have been several um, uh, improvements, of course, both in the uh, point of view, from the point of view of the modeling of these constituents, but also upgrades to climatologies uh, that are used uh, in the NWP. Uh, and actually, in the configuration which is used operationally by CAMS nowadays, it's not uh, climatologies that are used any longer, but um, CAMS runs with fully prognostic interactive aerosols in ozone in, in the radiation. So that's like a, a recent development, which is quite uh, important. And this is just an illustration of uh, the CAMS service. Um, some of you may be familiar with it. I put the website there. Um, it's a, a service that covers uh, both global and uh, regional European air quality. And uh, at ECMWF, uh, it is the global component that it's run. So um, we produce uh, five day forecasts of uh, um, atmospheric composition and uh, um, using um, uh, data, uh, satellite data for initialization. And then there is verification using ground-based measurements and uh, um, there are uh, prescribed um, anthropogenic emissions and the fire emissions uh, that um, go into the system. Natural aerosols are um, uh, modeled through model parameters. And so that's, uh, it's all integrated and uh, it's, um, it's based on the ECMWF for the bar. So it's the same system that's used for the numerical weather prediction uh, with the addition of the um, aerosol integrated chemistry and aerosol representation. And uh, yes, now, uh, so this is the system that we have used to look at the um, aerosol impacts at the SQL scales. Uh, the CAMS system, um, the CAMS service provides a forecast uh, out to day five. So it's considered the medium range. So this research that we've done on the S2S scales was, um, uh, you know, a bit of a, uh, a new, <laughs> a new thing that uh, we, we decided to look into because we felt that um, it was uh, interesting, important to uh, look at these aspects. And so with my colleague, uh, Frederic Pitar, we decided to use, uh, adapt the the CAM system to run it um, at the um, monthly scales. Um, in this case, uh, for this uh, initial experiments that we did, um, we um, only included aerosol direct effects um, and we had uh, like fully prognostic aerosols in the radiation scheme. Um, we had the free, um, observed emissions for biomass burning. Um, a total, um, we had an ensemble size um, of 11 members at about uh, um, 60 kilometer resolution and uh, 91 levels. And uh, because we had a uh, uh, five start date, we augmented the ensemble size to 55. So 55 cases or ensemble members. And we did the uh, six month simulations. But what I'm gonna show you here, it's mostly the um, analysis of the first month of the simulations. And we ran for the period 2003 to 2015. And the results are summarized in a um, article in a monthly weather review. 
Uh, so we ran different configuration to control runs with the aer climatological aerosols, one from uh, um, a Tegen, uh, a paper by uh, Ina Tegen and uh, collaborators from 997, which was the old climatology. And then a, a new climatology that was developed here in CMWF based on the CAMS uh, reanalysis uh, by Alessio Bozzo. And then two prognostic runs, one initialized from the CAMS interim reanalysis, um, and then one initialized by um, like a free running aerosol simulation for four experiments in total. And here, um, the example of um, an impact on, um, sorry, I have like the bar of the controls just on top of the title. So I'll see if I can, yeah. So this is the temperature bias at week four. So you see the control, then you see the two prognostic runs showing, um, like a general, not everywhere, but a small improvement in some areas, which, um, you know, as I said, the only difference between these runs were the interactive aerosols, either from climatology or from fully prognostic and interactive, uh, and the two initializations. So basically, any difference that you see in these plots could be ascribed to the, to the aerosols. And you see uh, that um, you have a slightly reduced biases um, up to, you know, between 0 0.5 and 2 degrees in some areas. And particularly the impact is more felt in the Mediterranean basin, um, in the Asian dust belt and the um, North Pacific Ocean and the North Atlantic dust belt. Uh, you can see slight, a slight reduction of uh, temperature bias at week four. So this is like four weeks into the forecast. For precipitation, similar plots. And uh, well, you know, it, you really have to um, maybe uh, have some uh, faith, but there is a reduction in, a small reduction in bias uh, between 0 0.5 and one millimeter per day, particularly in Anastasia. Um, it's you know, we're not looking at huge impacts, but even like, you know, this, uh, um, this uh, impact that may be small is actually significant. And I can show you here, for example, in this, uh, what we call score cards, which summarize the impact, um, you know, in a sort of concise way, you have to, um, you look at the column and you see several acronyms and those are meteorological variables that you know, are uh, of interest. And uh, for example, uh, temperature at two meters, uh, sea surface temperature, mean sea level pressure, temperature at 550 uh, hectopascal, UV, uh, so winds at uh, 50 hectopascal, et cetera. And you see several uh, like you know, levels, so you have 200 hectopascal, 500 hectopascal and 850. And when you, whenever you see um, a blue dot, a blue dot, uh, which is dark blue, it means that you have a positive significant impact. So that means that the experiment with the interactive aerosol was significantly better, <laughs> according to this, uh, uh, this uh, probability skill score, um, than the control. And actually you see that with respect to um, both uh, uh, runs, with respect to the uh, control one, which had the old uh, Tegan climatology, they were substantially better uh, with respect to the control. And you see mostly blue and mostly uh, significant uh, blue. And uh, um, this is actually, um, it might not seem a lot, but usually these scorecards, uh, they, they don't have these uh, big blue dots. You know, usually the impacts of uh, changes are you know, generally small, smaller. So we were very, very uh, surprised and pleased to see this type of impact. When you compare with the control two, which is the one with the uh, Bozzo climatology, the new climatology, you still see 
a positive, largely a positive impact of having aerosol, prognostic aerosol, rather than the climatological aerosol, but that is less so. And I think that uh, der derived from the fact that the, uh, the mean state of that climatology and the, the mean state of the prognostic aerosol was uh, quite similar. And so, but you still see even at week four, some impact. And again, that's quite surprising. And even like at the upper level, so you get some impact. Uh, if you look on the bite side, even at uh, Z500, geo potential at 500 at Pascal at week four, you see a positive significant impact. Overall, the impact is, you know, uh, positive, even if it might not be significant. So again, quite encouraging results. So we began to wonder why can we see, why do we see this? What's the physical mechanism behind it? And when uh, looking, digging into the literature, literature uh, we found that this article by Tian et and co author from 2011, in which he analyzed the time series spectrum of the modest aerosol optical depth anomalies over the Atlantic. And noticed that the intra-seasonal variance of aerosol optical depth was explaining about a quarter of the total variance, meaning that there is quite a, um, a, an impact of the seasonal. So obviously the, the vari variability of the aerosols um, on the seasonal and sub-seasonal scales is very important. So we tried to connect this with our results and we calculated thus all aerosol optical anomalies in the various phases of the MJO. The MJO is the one of the biggest drivers of uh, uh, subseasonal predictability. It's a pattern of precipitation and uh, convection um, across the tropical, um, uh, the whole uh, tropical belt. And so we wanted to see what was happening to the aerosols during the different phases of the MJO. I'm not gonna go into details in that, but just to show you like what, what we did was to try to look at the dust anomalies um, from the CAMS interim reanalysis and from our run, the prognostic run. And if you see, at the, if you look at the panels, um, you have uh, that the patterns in CAMS uh, reanalysis and in the prognostic runs are largely the same. Maybe the magnitude is not the same, but the patterns are, um, are, and they are actually um, also, they change according to the phase of the MJO. So for example, opposite, ops, opposite phases of the MJO, for example, phase two, three and phase six, seven, have opposite impact on the aerosol variability. And this uh, to us was an indication that the MJO modulation is actually a robust signal. And that is why, um, the aerosols um, you know, have this impact in the subseasonal prediction because they are, you know, their variability is connected to um, the mo a modulator of the, uh, at, this, at those scales, namely the MJO. And, uh, and this is uh, uh, the actually only slide that I have about uh, um, actually monthly dust prediction um, or monthly aerosol prediction. And this was, uh, if you wish, uh, um, some like, you know, um, not an afterthought. We were after uh, like the, the impacts at the S2S scales, uh, but, it, you know, in order to obtain that, we had to have a prediction on those scales of the aerosols. And we just wanted to check how good that prediction was. And we were quite surprised that it was indeed actually not that, not that bad. So this is the rank probability skill score of three, you know, comparing to the two prognostic runs. And so the orange and the green are the prognostic runs and uh, blue is persistence. Persistence is the, if you wish, the simplest, uh, one of the simplest uh, um, monthly forecasts that you can have. You can just say that what you have today will stay for the rest of the month, you know, what you have this week will stay for the next week. And um, actually, particularly at uh, week, uh, obviously, one, two, and three, but even at week four, the prognostic run, particularly the one initialized from the CAMS reanalysis in orange, 
uh, was uh, beating consistently persistence, which means that you know the, the forecast itself has some value, and um, even a month ahead, we could have had we could have a prediction of dust which is somewhat meaningful, and that that was true also for the um, other uh, run initialized uh, from a free running um, model, although. Um, I must say that obviously, as you can see from this plot, the skill of the uh, run initialized from the reanalysis uh, is a lot higher. And so this is, uh, I say, it was quite uh, you know, encouraging and uh, we have not really pursued it further, but we are um, you know, running new experiments uh, and you know, checking again um, you know, this result with new model versions. I wanted to take uh, also uh, just talk quickly about another aspect. I know most of you are interested in dust, but um, uh, maybe some of you might also be interested in biomass burning. And um, we looked at, at uh, this case uh, from our runs, um, from this uh, S2S runs. We looked at this uh, case of the Indonesian fires of 2015, which was a, an exceptional uh, case. Um, and uh, there was like devastating effects in the whole region due to the wildfires. And we actually were very surprised, but uh, because we used observed emissions, we were able to predict uh, temperature anomalies connected to the, um, to the aerosol, to the smoke aerosols six months ahead and of course you know that's like um it doesn't normally happen like this you can see that you know um the the pattern of the cooling really matches very well the um the the, the pattern of the fires this doesn't happen easily because uh, normally you don't have already the emissions when you do the forecast you have to uh, first, uh, obviously, have some kind of model for the emissions. Uh, in our case, this was a ray forecast, so we were looking backward and we were uh, able to prescribe the observed emissions. But what we wanted to emphasize with this is that, um, like, like, if we have a model for fire emissions, uh, we could actually and we could predict that, we could have a prediction also of the impacts that these fires could have on the, on, the, uh, on the weather really, and on the, not only both the air quality, but also the impact on the meteorology. And of course, uh, you cannot do that with climatologists. That's, that's the point that we wanted to make as well, that for extreme events, the climatology obviously doesn't capture but this problem of uh, evaluating the aerosols uh, impact on numerical um, weather prediction at the middle range at the S2S uh, range uh, is uh, the subject of uh, a project now coordinated by Ariane Frasso Frassoni uh, from CP Tech Brazil. And it's uh, uh, a collaboration between the WGNE, S2S, and GO. Um, and um, I put like all the people that are involved here. We have been uh, um, asked to, well, to contribute to experiments. So there was a call for uh, you know, contributions uh, for medium range experiments and S2S experiments to understand again, the role uh, of aerosols on the NWP. Uh, from the point of view of several models. So, because obviously uh, it's all very well, you know, the ECMWF uh, uh, results uh, were interesting, but, you know, we wanted to understand if it was something isolated or if uh, these impacts were also seen in other models and if they were similar in a way. And so we participated to this uh, S2S experiments and the medium range experiments, but I, I contributed to the S2S. So we basically, uh, oh yes, and the goals of the projects, as I, as I mentioned, were to understand the, the impact and the importance of the aerosols at the um, short range, medium range and S2S scales, and also try to understand um, the capability of predicting the aerosols in themselves at, at those scales. Um, um, and also um, understand um, what is the relevance for, of the forecast skill for quality forecasting and vice versa. What's the relevance of the 
um, composition forecasts for, for the numerical weather prediction. And um, so we reran um, more recently these experiments um, um, again with the ensemble system at ECMWF. The configuration was uh, quite similar uh, to what we used. Uh, we had 55 members with five different start dates and uh, a newer, a more recent uh, model version. And we ran a longer period, um, so 2003 to 2019, but this time we only had one month simulations. And we ran two different, um, three experiments, a control experiment with the climatology that it's uh, now of in the um, operations, uh, which is uh, again, uh, the bots of climatology. Um, and then uh, and two uh, different um, prognostic runs, one initialized from the CAMS reanalysis and one re initialized from, the, uh, from a fixed year. And uh, uh, the analysis of this uh, uh, is not uh, terminated. We just uh, uh, submitted our results to CPTEC. So there will be a joint analysis of these results. But actually what we observed was uh, a slight uh, skill degradation in, uh, with the interactive aerosols in this case, mostly connected with dust, as you can see here in that uh, circle that I highlighted, and also uh, biomass burning, uh, connected to biomass burning as well. So it is actually not going in the hope direction, but it's still showing a lot of sensitivity to aerosols, particularly dust aerosols and biomass burning aerosols. So it's still something that it's uh, you know quite relevant to, um, to investigate further and to, um, uh, to consider. And we look forward to also understand what is the impact in other, in other models, you know, uh, particularly models that have uh, you know, the same um, scales that run at the S2S scale. Um, so uh, that hopefully, you know, in a few months, I'll be able to present those results. But um, I wanted to put something like that was just produced recently by a colleague here at ECMWF, Thomas Hayden. And this was, uh, um, uh, this is uh, still trying to understand the, the impact of aerosols in the medium range. And this is the mean error in the temperature at 150 at the Pascal uh, from the um, high resolution run, which is nine ki uh, kilometer. And uh, this run uses the climatological aerosol. And this uh, verification is against uh, um, on analysis. So it's comparing, you know, like the, the forecast with the, the day five forecast with its own analysis. And it covers a period which is quite long. It's from uh, April 2021 to um, January 2022. And if I flip, this plot, so try to focus on the, uh, the tropical area, particularly the, the dust area. And then I show you the next slide, which is the uh, what comes out. So the same verification, mean error for temperature 150 at the Pascal from the CAMS. So it's uh, the same model, but at a lower resolution and with the interactive aerosols. And you can see that actually, there is quite a nice reduction of uh, mean error right in the if I flip and you focus on the, um, particularly the um, um, Sahara area and, the, and the, um, the Atlantic. And you can see that actually the mean error is lower in camps. And that's quite interesting. Of course, I didn't draw your attention to other areas, for example, like uh, Asian, um, uh, um, like Asia, where actually it's, you know, it's the opposite. You have quite a large error, and that's possibly associated to um, to the aerosols there. But you know, looking at the at the tropics, you know, um, and also quite a bit in the areas of uh, biomass burning, but particularly, I'd say, yeah, the the Sahara and the um, tropical Atlantic. I think it's uh, quite interesting, and I I. You know, I do think that there is an indication that the aerosols there are doing something positive. But again, this is still, you know, to be investigated further. And uh, um, yeah, 
I think I'm actually uh, already at the end, so there's going to be plenty of time for um, for uh, uh, questions if you have any. Uh, but um, so I'm already at my summary slide. Um, I I hope that you know in this uh, brief uh, like you know, talk I uh, convince you that um, aerosols are indeed a very important part of their system, and uh, um, they are very important for an accurate numerical weather prediction. Um, and it's very important to have a good uh, NWP model um, with the physical and chemical processes and realistic emissions uh, to be able to have the, the you know, a good framework to model the aerosols, but vice versa. In this framework, the aerosols can also um, help to improve the, the weather forecast at different scales, um, including the S2S scales uh, via different interaction, interaction mechanisms, as uh, we discussed earlier. Of course, the degree of complexity uh, needed in NWP uh, depends on the specific application. It's very difficult to, um, to have one size that fits all, and uh, there might be uh, the need for a compromise um, with the computational cost. There are possibilities out there. For example, um, incomes, they often talk about uh, running a, a dual grid, running, for example, the aerosols at a lower resolution and then running using the information in the higher resolution run, in the NWP run, uh, or, for example, use single precision to um, um, be able to reduce the computational cost and run the aerosols at the same high resolution as the NWP um, prediction. And of course, as I said, I didn't really talk a lot about that, but I do believe there is quite a bit of uh, potential for S2S prediction of the aerosol fields in themselves, particularly the dust. And uh, um, I say particularly the dust because the dust is intimately connected with the model fields such as winds. And so the emissions of dust are model driven. Whereas for example, uh, for um, prediction of other aerosols such as uh, fire, biomass burning, you need to take into account not only weather parameters, but also other aspects, uh, uh, not to mention the anthropogenic uh, um, ignitions. And so it is uh, a bit more complicated, but for dust, because dust is uh, integrated in the model and it's uh, you know, mechanically driven, um, I really believe that uh, um, there could be the possibility of a good prediction of dust at uh, these scales, um, at least as good as the model can be for, you know, for winds um, at these scales. But I, I think it's something that should be explored more and um, um, I hope uh, there will be some uh, some resources, some possibility to look into that um, in the in the future. And um, yes, I think that's all I have for now. And uh, I'm happy to uh, receive questions. Thanks a lot, Angela, for your nice talk. In fact, you were super on time, a little <laughs> bit earlier. Oh, that's good. And, yeah. Then we have more time for discussion and questions and. As I see in the questions and, and answers box, we have several questions from two participants. Then what we will do as in the last um, events is promote these, these uh, participants as a panelist. Then they can send you directly okay. your quest, the questions that they have. One is Christophe Lavais. Christophe, I am searching you for giving you um, Shall I stop sharing, Sarah, or shall I leave the presentation? As you wish, as you wish. Then, Christoph, welcome to the panelist. You can raise the question directly to Angela. Hello, hello, good. Thank you very much uh, for, for this very interesting presentation. Uh, my question, I, I think it's partly um, answered was about your uh, forecast uh, when you performed the four tests with the two um, the, the two different prognostic uh, tests and um, the climatology if it's if the simulation covers all the year or just one season and if you focus uh, just over one season do you consider that you can expect different results if you cover all the year mm. yes thanks for your question 
Yes, what I showed was covering only a part of the year. It was six months starting um, August 1st, if I'm not wrong, or July 1st. So it was the you know, second part of the year. And yes, you do see different behaviors depending whether you're looking at summer or, um, or winter. Um, um, we saw more of an impact uh, um, in the period that I showed uh, largely uh, associated to the dust. So we were trying to focus on, you know, the peak of the dust season. Of course, then the longer the prediction, the more diluted the impact will be, uh, which is, uh, you know, I guess also intuitive. Uh, but you're absolutely right. There is a, um, a, a seasonal effect in the impact, you know, as well. Um, and for example, for the biomass burning, we focused on the um, on the September in September. September, so we have like start date of September 1st, because that's the, you know, biomass burning season. Uh, for the dust, as I said, we tried uh, July, August, we did a, a May date, a start, May start date as well. Um, so yes, we do look at different um, start dates. I don't know if that answers your questions, but yeah, you're absolutely right. There is, a, you know, the impact varies throughout the year. Thank you. And you have another question, right, Christoph? In this, uh, there was yes, something yes, the, about your graph, one yeah, of your graphs. The, the, second, the second question was, was also something a bit general. Do you consider there is no bias when you look at the score of your, of your simulation since you're using for some prognostic or some test, you're using the, re the CAMS reanalysis and or you compare all the time with this kind of reanalysis? Do you think? Um, it's not maybe more fair to use observations to assess your, your forecast. Because when you say there is no uh, big um, bias over Sahara and Atlantic is the region where you have a very low amount of, of, of observation to, to be assimilated. So if you use the two models, the, the model and the reanalysis coming from something relatively similar, you can expect to have a, a reduction of the bias. Yes, yeah, you're right. Um, you're right. Ideally, we should look at uh, verification with the um, observations. I must say that in the S2S work, people rely a lot on uh, um, the reanalysis for validation because uh, uh, some of the parameters are not directly observed. So, for example, even the, the dust aerosols, you don't have, a, well, you have data sets, but you know, uh, usually it's. Um, yeah, you look at own analysis or reanalysis, and you're right, it's possibly a limiting, it is a limiting factor. And I think that uh, for certain variables, for example, T2 meter temperature, we should really have like a, value, a verification based on observations. Um, but it's just, uh, yeah, the practice is to, to use uh, the reanalysis to do this, uh, you know, scoring. You know, and uh, of course uh, there is uh, a scaling, you know, an adjustment that, that you you do um, the biasing that you do using the forecasts. So you have like you know forecasts uh, for about uh, 12, 15 years, however long you can go, and that's what what you use to scale yes. the biases. Yeah, uh, but you are absolutely right that it would be interesting to do a verification based on observation. I believe that CP Tech in this exercise that I mentioned, um, you know, coordinated the comparison that will use some observations to do the scoring of the of the model or you know scoring the, the evaluation of the models. Thank you. You're welcome. We have another participant that it was very active is Carlos Perez that has uh -huh. many questions for you. And then okay. Carlos. <laughs> You are promoted, I hope, to the panelist. Yeah, he's here. You are <laughs> muted. Okay. Yes. So, uh, Hi. Hi, Angela. Hi, Carlos. So uh, it's just I think a couple of questions were already responded, uh, and 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 uh, one one was uh, on the effect on the medium range forecast, and you you showed like a, a slide already, where you showed already the positive impact apparently at least in the Atlantic. Yes. Yes. So um, 
yeah, and the other question was about uh, was about the uh, observations used for evaluation. So now I understand that you evaluate with the with the reanalysis. Mm -hmm. I would argue though that the reanalysis uh, has, I mean, if I believe that the reanalysis has a satellite observations over the Sahara, mm -hmm. so it's not that it's depleted of observations. So it it it's um, it contains observations so that that could be uh, yeah. I, I think a reasonable way of evaluating it. By the way, yes. Yeah, yeah. And for the meteorological variables, it's the ERA-5 that's used. So okay. that's quite robust in the sense that, you know, it is quite heavily constrained by satellite data. The, the aerosol, you know, reanalysis, you know, is limited to the, to the MODIS. Um, but yes, it has data over the, the desert. You are right. Deep blue. Yeah. Yeah, and then the other question that I had, um, so I think, yeah, I mean, really what you show, it's really very promising and, and, and really, uh, I, mean, I think we should, be, we should be doing more experiments at, at the seasonal scale. So um, how, do you, how do you deal with the ocean in these simulations? Uh, um, and it's a kind of a data set, it's a, it's a model, uh, what, what, how do you deal the, with that? The ocean is, because this is the ensemble uh, system which we use at ECMWF, you know, for the uh, monthly forecast, it's fully coupled. So you okay. have a fully coupled ocean, um, you know, coupled from day zero, and uh, yeah, so it's, um, um, yeah, that's uh, part of the, yeah, sure. of the, mm -hmm. yes. So, and, and so like, uh, it's, uh, um, it, have you, have you tested what is the importance of the ocean across the scale? So for example, you know, from medium range to, uh, to subseasonal to seasonal, I guess that of course it increases with, uh, with time. But yes. is there any quantitative um, analysis of that? Um, mm, I have not done it, but uh, colleagues have. So um, yes, it's been shown actually that it was thought that the, the ocean was uh, not so important for the medium range, but it's actually been shown that, that even in the medium range, having a couple of ocean was sure. very beneficial. And so ECMWF a few years ago now decided to switch to fully interactive uh, couple of ocean from day zero. So mm -hmm. before it was only coupled after uh, I think day 15 for nice. the, you know, but now it, it's really from day zero. Uh, and, uh, and ECMWF is actively pursuing also coupled um, data simulation, coupled in its initialization, ocean and atmosphere. Uh, so it's, uh, no, it's very, very important. And of course, yes, um, uh, the, the longer you go, in the scale, in the forecast range scale, the more important the ocean becomes. But uh, yeah, it was shown to be very important. I can dig out, uh, you know, some plots for you from the past. Uh, it wasn't my research because I just inherited the system. All I did was to activate the aerosols in, at these scales. But uh, yeah, if you're interested in those aspects, in the importance of the ocean uh, for the yep. prediction, uh, I can send you some material. Okay, I think Sara, there are other questions. I don't want to keep uh, uh, the the whole time for me, so please invite others. Just a couple for customer. Nitko has one. Then means yes, why Nitko is asking. I will revise the the ones mm, that okay. are in the question. Uh, yeah, Angela, just tackle very important uh, aspect of modeling. Uh, how how to introduce the aerosol into NWP system. So. My question is, what is your expectations? E even on, on a shorter uh, scale, like uh, medium range forecast, uh, when ECMWF think or you think uh, that, uh, that you could uh, introduce interactive uh, direct and indirect effects of, of dust uh, in, into NWP? You know, I... I have like yeah, it's this is uh, um, you know off the record, so I I don't speak of, as a officially CMWF. You know, it's mm -hmm. more my, um, there's this new pro uh, program called Destination Earth, which is looking at uh, um, the digital twin of the Earth and uh, at high resolution, and um, it just started uh, in November last year, and it's in its first phase, but it's gonna continue and grow. Um, and they look at their system um, under all you know aspects and uh, composition and aerosols will be part of it so mm -hmm. i expect that you know 
thanks to the and this program has also a lot of uh, it's very also driven from the point of view of computational advances and machine learning and all that and uh, running on uh, you know a new architectures uh, new computer architectures so graphical graphical uh, inter um, sorry graphical GUI uh, I'm not an expert in that but uh, the reason why I mentioned it is because that's going to be key uh, because the problem is still like the cost, you know, the, the cost is a big problem, um, even for dust only. And then, of course, if you, you you may have the interactive dust, but then you still have to have the climatological, all the rest, you know, so you, you have to be able to develop uh, a mixed um, a mixed type of model in which you can maybe put some species interactive and others uh, climatological uh, but i really believe that we will see great advances thanks to this new program you know destination art because they are putting quite a bit of resources and that's funded by the european uh, commission and uh, you know i think we will see it uh, let's say possibly in the next five five uh, ten years mm -hmm. it seems like a long time but you know uh, yes i course. suppose uh, yeah um i really have uh, you know high expectations you know, and that's uh, this is run by ECMWF, so it's all going to be, if you want, integrated in the NWP developments as well. So it's not a separate uh, entity. It's like, you know, so I really think we're going to see some interesting advances uh, soon. If not in direct integration, um, then this multi-grid approach that I mentioned, you know, so having two, two different grids, one coarser for the aerosol, you know, and the chemistry. The chemistry is also quite demanding, of course, and then uh, a finer grid for the NWP, you know, this type of uh, solutions. Uh, but it is uh, quite technology driven as a problem, to be honest, at yeah. the moment. Mm, no, not more than the science, but I think the science is quite understood and appreciated and we all would like to see the aerosols interactive fully, you know, but uh, yeah. The climatologists do quite well, except when you have uh, exceptional events, of course, mm -hmm. which nowadays happens actually quite often. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, okay, yeah. thanks, thanks, Angela. There is an anonymous attendee that is asking about the S2S prediction dataset, if it's accessible for public people and how long is is the period of this data set? Uh, yes, so um, the S2S, um, okay, these runs here that I showed, uh, yes, they are archived, so they just need to contact me and I can give access, but they're not uh, public because, you know, they're, yeah, they were just experiments that I ran. However, if the, they're, you, uh, they're interested in general in the S2S prediction, there is a, a possibility to, to access the prediction uh, monthly, and uh, through the S2S uh, database uh, maintained by WMO, it's, uh, it's ECMWF and CMA, I think that they have the, uh, they distribute the data. And not only you can access the ECMWF uh, S2S prediction, but also that of the other participating um, models. So looking into onto the WMO, under the WMO page, so looking for S2S, you will be able to see how to acquire the data. Uh, but specifically, if there is an interest in this data set, then that, that's not available publicly. <laughs> so I, I wouldn't, I can make it available, but yeah, it's uh, this experiment uh, just not by me. Yeah, we can share, I, I will share the email uh, in this question because I'm not sure who is the person that ah, okay. uh, yes, is please. asking because it's anonymous. Yeah. But uh, we will put the. Yeah. I will put your your email in the chat. Yeah. And this I, I person. The, I had one more slide with the, oh. asking for questions, and I have like my email there. So like yeah, if uh, um, anybody wants to contact me and ask me asks me question, ask me this, yeah. Yeah, I will put in the chat just in case. Okay. Yeah. Uh, ECMWF. Then yeah. if someone wants to. As for this data set, just remember, contact uh, Angela directly. Yeah. And then we have Betsy Andrews that uh, if 
is asking about the comparison with in situ observations like nephelometers. Mm -hmm. um, could you say something about what additional value those observations provide for the evaluation? I mean, in your opinion, how can of feedback these in situ yes. nephelometer idols all the scattering measurements? Yes. Can provide I you. Yeah, thanks, Betsy. I have looked at those actually in the context of actress, and in fact, I think that one in, in one slide I show one example of that. Um, um, I think they are very valuable. Yeah, they complement very well. The, um, uh, we use a lot of AUD. This now I'm not talking about the S to S prediction. Now I'm talking about the five day forecast, uh, the CAMS forecast. Uh, the main uh, data set that's used is the Aronet the aerosol optical depth. That's still the main you know, source of the uh, routine verification. But the nephelometer data are uh, being, you know, were looked at. Um, I don't think that's been uh, made operational, but they were very valuable, very interesting. We got some very interesting results um, uh, and showing that the model was actually okay in predicting uh, the light scattering um, in some background stations. Obviously, not so good in the um, in the mountain stations and urban stations. You know, there were some like you know, uh, but overall, um, it was uh, very useful. The requirement that they have, but I believe that now it's being um, it's been done um, as part of CAMS, one of the CAMS contracts, uh, is the that they uh, the, that the data are provided in near real time or at least a day later, at the most because to do the routine verifications of the service of the model, the data need to get in, you know, so that element is important. But of course, Sarah knows quite well that then the, this data can also be used for the evaluation a posteriori of the, you know, the model forecast, but also the reanalysis. So they are, I think they are quite heavily used now, or, you know, um, as I said, I looked into that myself from the, first initial research point of view. And I was quite impressed at the, uh, the quality of you know, the data, but also how the model was able to represent these uh, parameters at the surface. Again, not under all situations, but under most uh, circumstances. I think that the, the question is answered, but Betsy, if you want to, to ask uh, something, anything more specific, I can give you voice. Uh, it looks like it's okay. Then, Carlos, there is your last question because we don't have any other question in the to do. Establish Solomon is, is welcome your, your email, Angela, in the chat. And okay. yeah. If Carlos wants to raise this last question, uh, yes. Yeah, so uh, I, I, yeah, I forgot to to ask on the evaluation, like that 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 statistic that you included. How do you evaluate it? I mean, uh, how do you evaluate the weekly, by weekly, monthly? So the this this statistic that you use um, compared to the reanalysis, it what 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 can you define it a little bit more precisely, just to understand. Uh, is it the one you mean uh, for the dust? Yeah. Yeah, the one for the dust is like a, a probability score. I'm not the best person to um, to answer that question, but you know, you base it on the um, on the on the reanalysis. Yes, so it's based on the CAMS reanalysis, and but then con conceptually, it's like integrated over space, or or it really it, it is really a global. Yeah, it is a global measure. Yeah. Okay, but it's average over space. It's not that you average the score uh, after calculating the score per grid cell, but it's more like it's more generic on. That's what I don't get. Uh, yeah, to be honest, you know, um, it's uh, uh, yeah. I will have to ask Frederick about that because uh, I'm not an expert on how they do these um, probabilistic skill scores. You know, for the um, yeah for the S two S. Okay. But, uh, no I, I believe it's global. I think there is first an average, you know. But yeah, okay. let me not uh, say something. <laughs> it's okay. We, we can we can discuss. Yeah. I mean, I was just uh, curious. Yeah. To see how yes. No. No. Yeah. Evaluate that. Okay. Yes. No. You're interesting because it's quite different from how we are used to in the in the medium range, you know, or or in the short range. We do things more like uh, comparing almost. Uh, 
uh, at the same time, you know, and, you know, same uh, locations, you know, it's, it's a bit different that the way they score the ensembles, uh, you know, the probabilistic uh, prediction. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Perfect timing. It's four o'clock and we will close. Thanks a lot, Angela, for your time and for all the discussion that we had today. And it's time that, uh, yeah, I need to share my screen. Sorry, Angela, I think that- Oh yeah, of course, stop sharing. As a host, uh, I have powers. Mm -hmm. Then um, just, I want to present the next speaker that will be Jasper Cook from the States. And he will introduce a little bit this mysterious abundance of coarse desert dust in the, in the earth. And because mm -hmm. he's from the other side of the state, we will delay a little bit the starting hour of this webinar. It will be at five Central European time, fourth universal uh, time coordinate, and very early in the morning for him <laughs> in the Pacific coast. Then uh, the registration is open. The announcement is in the website of the WMO Barcelona DAS Regional Center. Then if you want to join us to the, this next meeting, uh, webinar, it will be 13th April, remember, at five, exceptionally at five. And uh, you are welcome to join us. Have a nice day. Thanks a lot. Uh, Bye, everyone. Okay. Bye. 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 Bye.